standing up, and it's a pity because this is going to be this would be the liveliest lecture if I felt lively myself. But uh, so I'll do my best. So I'm, I'm sorry to be a bit, bit flagged out today. I think I put a bit too much work in in the last week. So what, what I want to talk about today uh, is the role of endogenous money in instability. And um, like last week, I, you know, I talked about the, the financial instability hypothesis yesterday and how to model it. Um, today, when you look at all the people who are prominent in disequilibrium economics, they've also focused on the role of the, the bank se banking sector. And that's a major contrast to the neoclassical thought, which ignores the banking sector and, of course, is equilibrium focused. And I want to show you how uh, the, the really special features of Minsky, that the capacity of the software package to model monetary dynamics, which may, that's the reason it's been invented. The stuff I've shown you so far, modeling dynamic systems you can do with a number of other programs, but uh, Minsky is the only one you can do the monetary modeling with, and I'll show you why in a moment. And then to use that to contrast the endogenous money perspective with loanable funds, which of course is the dominant attitude in, uh, in neoclassical economics. And I would like to show you a fully a full money model of Minsky, which is monetary based, but I realize I've made errors in the one I'm going to show you. But it's not full yet, but it gives you an idea of where we might get to. And then I'll talk a bit about where, soft, where the program's going to go in the future. Hopefully with some help from Ecuador. Okay, well, endogenous money, you can you know, use the old cliche, it's so yesterday, because when you take a look in the literature, you can't find it in the mainstream. Okay. The mainstream's rejected it. But it was a mainstream belief. And that the belief was that banks were a very special part of capitalism because they can create money, which other institutions can't do. And that was a commonplace attitude up to and ending just slightly before the general theory. And I'll give you an example of it. Take a look at this set of statements here. Borrowing from banks are different. Businessmen can achieve extra borrowings because the banks are ready to allow the ratio of their reserves to liability to decrease. Um, this enables them to expand or to enlarge the flow of stem floating capital available more than they do in the absence of that ability from banks. In other words, modern banking makes the monetary supply more elastic. Who do you reckon said that? Any guesses? Okay. Because I think Schumpeter might have said, wouldn't it? Or Marx, if he wasn't using usual adjectives he uses. Okay. It was actually a guy called Pigou. Heard of Pigou? Yeah, okay. You know, um, the Pigou effect is the main thing we know for him these days, and that's an alleged reason why falling prices would increase demand. Okay. But writing in 1927, before the general theory came out, that's the attitude he had to banks. Now, intriguingly, in the general theory, Pigou was a person Keynes bashed up as a conservative economist. Okay? So, uh, and look at this, he's saying theories, theories, theories on employment seems to get all you can out of classical theory, and it's a striking demonstration that theory has nothing to offer. Okay? So he's just denigrating Pigou. So Pigou's other work has been lost, and one of my young colleagues, Nathan Tankus, found this particular statement and even found that. Pigou does graphs just like mine from the 1920s and, 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 and 1920, using the same sort of concept I do about the role of debt and aggregate demand. So this was part of the mainstream. And it's then, but it's been eliminated after Keynes. And I think in some extent, Keynes is responsible for it. But I'll, I'll show you how much it exists in the non-equilibrium people um, that I'm building this particular course on. So looking at Trump, he says, the carrying out of new combinations takes place through the withdrawal of services of labour and land. He uses land as a proxy for capital, which uh, I believe is an error, but it's nonetheless, he's saying, you've got these currently fully employed services and you need to take them away from where they're fully employed and use them in new entrepreneurial activities. He said, and this leads us to the heresy that money performs an essential function and also the processes in terms of means of payment of goods are not merely reflexes. Now what he's saying here is that the money that we spend in the economy isn't just the result of the goods we've sold. Okay? He's saying it's more than that. And he's saying, again, pointing out that even though you'll find people like the goo making the statement, that the general bias in economics has been to say that money doesn't matter. But he says, from this it follows that in real life total credit must be greater than it could be if there are only fully covered credit. By fully covered, he means money are raised by selling goods and services you currently have. 
So he's saying total credit exceeds the revenue from selling goods and services. Okay. So fully covered credit is money from selling goods and services. Total credit includes new spending power created by the banks. And that's an essential part of Schumpeter's story. Fisher. This is, this is in his book, Burns and Depressions, which I do recommend reading. It's, he has a short essay called The Debt Deflation Theory of Great Depressions. But there's more technical detail in Burns and Depressions, written in 1932. And he says, the payment of a debt owing to a commercial bank involves different consequences than paying a debt between one individual and another. He said a man-to-man -man debt can be paid without affecting the volume, volume of currency. Okay, because it goes from one, it goes to the other, and it's legal tender, and it's still outstanding, and that's a very useful way of putting it, because you can spend from your assets. If you have assets of a loan to a friend, and then a friend repays you, your assets don't change. When they've repaid you, you can spend from the money of you repaid you. But equally, your friend could spend from the loan you made to them before you repay the loan. So the two cancel each other out. But overall, the amount of money that is, is, is created by that, well, the amount of money in that lending transaction remains outstanding and doesn't rise or fall. Okay? Okay. But he said when a bank, when a debt to a commercial bank is paid, that amount of deposit currency simply disappears. Okay? You take it out of your loan, you pay it, you, you, you pay it out of your deposit account, you pay your loan down, the amount of money declines. And Fisher, continuing here, says that therefore you contract the amount of money in circulation by paying back a debt. They said, now normally that's neutralised by the counter tendency of people taking out new debt at the same time as you're repaying yours. You said, but when there's a general state of over-indebtedness, and again, this is not a concept that makes sense in neoclassical theory, okay? but it does in this endogenous money perspective. When there's over-indebtedness, then the new borrowings will be by no means sufficient to restore the balance, and there'll be a shrinkage of the money in circulation. And Minsky, trying to put this in a very technical way, uh, in a very, very early paper back in 1963, said that if you're going to have growth, then the financial markets must be generating rising aggregate demand over time. He said, for that to be happening in the absence of falling prices, it's necessary that current spending be greater than current received income. And that you have some technique to reconcile that. There must be some way that spending is greater than income. He then said, it follows, therefore, for that to happen, at least some sectors finance part of their spending by emitting debt or selling assets. Now, I focus on the first one. The emitting selling assets is not quite as, 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 as direct, but emitting debt, it's saying you've got to be financing part of your spending out of debt to have growing aggregate demand. And continuing on, he said, for that to happen, uh, it must happen in such a way that there's not offsetting reductions in spending by the units. Now that will mean that some sectors have more than they expect to have at the end. And actually, rather intriguingly, uh, just recently, uh, a, a very uh, prominent neoclassical economist, Nick Rowe, who writes a blog called Worthwhile Canadian Initiative, attempted to put my uh, perspective on aggregate demand being greater than income into a more neo neoclassical framework, and he did it successfully using this sort of idea. So he has a thing called what, Keen, what Steve Keen is probably trying to say, and he got it quite right, and it's really worth taking a look at. And it comes down to the point that Minsky is making here, that this is a non-equilibrium process. Okay? You're going to have, if you, because everybody is, well not everybody, but there's, because there's more borrowing going on than you know about, effectively, your balances, you're expecting to go into debt, more people are borrowing than you know about. You don't go into as much debt as you thought you would. Your balances are larger than you expect them to be. Okay. That disequilibrium thing, I think Nick Rowe captured that quite nicely in that particular blog post, so I do recommend taking a look at that. He said, for that to happen, uh, you have to have the creation of new money, either an increase in velocity of existing money, which can do it as well, but it's much more minor, or the creation of new money. So all of these disequilibrium theorists Oh, uh, Mag Banked, B A N K D. That's great. How <laughs> I said it that, pardon me. That sounds like somebody pronouncing it who's got a cold, which is me. Okay, hang on a sec. Come back here, Mag Banks, 
S. Okay, there we go. I have to sneeze pretty shortly to make banks debt and money part of their theories, and they argue that somehow debt adds to aggregate. I'm calling it effective demand. We we use the term aggregate demand in such a way that I think it's it's locked in the sense of coming from selling goods and services. But effective demand is greater. There's something being added to it that comes from beyond spending from our own income alone. So we've got a model. From my point of view, pardon me, we have to model bank debt and money explicitly to explore these ideas properly. Uh, and hence that's why I've designed Minsky to be able to make that possible. But, um, as I said, there's, there's to talk about why Minsky is, is different. There are many programs out there. I've each of these is a link to other programs that do the same sort of work. Let's take a look at Simulink here. Coming up, let's see. There we go. Amazingly, well, most economists aren't aware that software like this exists. I had a ridiculous exchange with a uh, younger neoclassical economist called Noah Noah Smith earlier this last uh, this year, or late last year, I think it was, asking me what do the wires do, as if I'd invented the idea of wiring equations to get like you saw Trum and Drayson doing last week. That Simulink was the uh, was the first major commercial program to do that. Engineers use it to design virtually everything. Retail price is about twenty thousand dollars. Okay, so it's serious software. Then Sim seems to be the leader in, in social theory, and you can get it free as an academic or pay, pay two grand to buy it retail. Stiller and I think uh, they were the original models used to build the limits to growth project of the Club of Rome, and they're about nineteen hundred dollars. XCOS is an open source free software package, and you can model financial dynamics if you like with those programs. It's feasible, but it, they don't provide checks to make sure that you have an entry from the source to the sink, because all financial transactions come from somewhere and go somewhere. Either whether you're taking out a new loan, you increase the loan in that increases your deposits, or you buy goods and you take money out of your deposit account and transfer to somebody else. So you must have two uh, system states affected by every flow. Now they don't, the, the wiring doesn't require that, and it doesn't check that the signs are right. Uh, and it's also, and this is really important, incredibly hard to add high levels of complexity. It just gets totally out of hand. Um, whereas I use in Minsky the natural paradigm of double entry bookkeeping. So to compare those for you, here's uh, say so a simple model, say banks lend to the firm sector. Firm sector hires workers. Workers and bankers consume the output of the firm sector and the firm sector repays its loans. Pretty simple. Okay? Well, let's watch that being built in Minsky. Bring up the table. Use assets versus liabilities here, first of all. Yeah, that's right. You're doing a balance sheet here. So you type in loans, then click on the button there that inserts a new row. Make this a liability. And notice the bank itself has now got this little, these little icons have popped out the bottom here. Loans and firms are both down the bottom here. Then I have workers. There's the liability of the bank, and finally equity, the bank, the bank's net value. It's cool, isn't it? Okay. Now, when you add the financial transactions like lend money, and I describe it as the flow of lend from the loans, notice the lenders over here, and it makes sure once you put it in there, it's saying we've well, got to now put a minus lend somewhere inside here to balance the row. And liabilities are shown as a negative to make that possible. And now when I put higher workers, wages turns up here. You make sure you're balanced. Pay interest. You've got to transfer that from the firm's from the firm's account across to the net value, the net worth of the bank. Then I have workers consuming. Bankers consuming. And 
and finally repayment. I had to expand the window there to make it visible. So once I've done that, I know my accounting is correct. Okay. Easy enough to understand? Okay. And that's the, just bring the table up there. He says, hopefully. What's it up to? Come on, load. Here we go. Ah, I've got it twice now. <laughs> I'll shut one of them down. Well, let's, like, having done that so far, let's bring up the table here. Let's say I wanted to include that they're actually capitalists to get dividends inside the system here. Well, that's easy to do. All I've got to do is say, well, let's whack in an extra row, extra column, pardon me. So let's say here we've got the firms with the liability. Click on the plus button, call this capitalists. And now you see there's an extra account will come down the bottom here in a moment, he says, hopefully. Yeah, there's capitalists. And now, uh, if let's say they pay dividends, then you'd have a flow of div from here going across to the capitalists there, and then you'd have consumption by them. I can make keyboard mistakes if I've got a cold. I'm allowed to be stuffing up here. That's consumption by capitalists. And notice the row sum over here is now saying cons k. If I actually forget, and I do this actually by one, st one stage by accident, if I don't put the right sign there, then I get the balance of saying it's two, it should be zero. So if I click here and I use the control arrow key, I can go back to the beginning and put in the minus key. And so I've added that extra level of complexity there. And that's just a single bank. I'll show you in a short while you can have as many banks as you want, all interrelated with each other. Okay. Let's go back to the presentation. Uh, yeah? You, know, you can do that as well. And I'll share the domain in a moment too. So look, as a flow chart. That same simple model I showed you, that's as a flow chart. Now, can you work that out straight away? You know, you could follow it if you tried going through it. So I've got colleagues working in places like the New Economic Foundation in London who are trying to build a monetary model of the economy using, I think, Stella in that particular case. And they've tremendous work and they really work their asses off to try to get it done. And finally, they've got the stage of abandoning it because to add complexity to that just got so damn complicated. And they couldn't follow it. Whereas the flowchart paradigm works extremely well. Uh, like you can see wires are crossing each other there. Notice I've got wages going to two places, and I've got minus sign up here and a plus here. But if I left one of those wires out, the program wouldn't bother saying something's wrong. There's no check for you, okay? And I could have the wrong sign and so on. So defining financial flows in Minsky, you know, as I've said, uh, actually this is how you actually put values on it now. If you if you right click and choose copy, then you can drag that flow down off the canvas, put it somewhere else. And the same thing for the accounts. And the simplest account to define would be uh, the flow where the interest flows. Interest flows are going to be the rate of interest on loans multiplied by loans. So you simply create a const or a parameter called rate of loans or a variable and wire them up and now you define that particular part of the financial system. So it's gone from a logical structure now to a, to a modelling structure. I think that's it that presentation. Yep. So but that's why you, you, you can do with it. But why would you bother? Because if you read the experts, banks don't matter. Okay. This is my first sortie with Paul Krugman way back last year when he decided to challenge my paper at INET, saying he's all for including the banking sector in stories where it's relevant, but why is it so crucial to a story about debt and leverage? 
and then saying later on, banks don't create demand that it's in there any more than anybody else does. Okay? Nothing special about banks. And saying a recent paper, uh, a blog post by a guy called Matthew Klein pointed him to an article by Tobin, and he said, look at that, it's at all the points they're making banks not being special, uh, the mechanical lending don't matter, nonsense about banks changing everything, yada, yada, yada. This is the conventional view. But I thought what I'd do is build the loanable funds funds model in Minsky. So you can actually, even if you don't believe in it, you can still build a model that, that fits that way of working. And he says, when, when, when debt is rising, it's not the economy as a whole borrowing more money. It's rather a case of less, less patient people, people who want to spend sooner rather than later, borrowing from more patient people. Now, I really thank Krugman for writing as clearly as he does. But this recurs like, a, you know, I look at this and think, it's, are we talking playground here? Or are we talking a capitalist system? You know, if it's got a childish side to it that I just find more patient, less patient, you know. You know capitalism, as far as I'm concerned. Anyway, versus endogenous money where banks lend. And then compare the two using Minsky and show what the fundamental differences are. And it's a deliberately simple model. I'm, I'm using parameters rather than behavioural functions. And I can vary the parameters in both models, but they're the same parameters. So the only difference is the structure between the two models. And I'm not modelling production explicitly either, just again to make it simple. So here we go. This is loanable funds. Sorry. Yeah. I have some of the same pressure, so I understand that feeling. I could criticise for an article I wrote in quantitative easing, for example, and people didn't realise that I wrote it in three hours flat because I had a, a, a column to fill, fill and I had to go and do an interview on a conservative Seattle radio station. So I pumped it out in three hours, you know. So that's true. But this is a consistent theme over years, you know. If he had a chance to revise it, he's had years to get back and say, well, you know, I've changed my mind or it's more complex than that, etc., etc. So, yeah. So here's building a model in Minsky. So first of all, you bring down a, a, a godly table. Then you create the, and call this the bank. And I'm going to create an asset here called reserves, because we're not bothering about loans by banks in this, uh, in this model. But they need to hold reserves for, um, if you put deposit, then you create a reserve as well. Then we have the patient agent. Notice the row sum, by the way, has to be summed to zero as well. So for the $100 deposit, there's got to be a $100 liability. So I type minus 100 for the amount in the column there. Then the impatient agent with no money at all. And then workers. And finally, the bank, the net value of the bank. And then we have all the usual those simple operations again. So the first one is lending by the patient agent, in this case to the impatient agent. So I have a lend, plus lend in the patient column and minus lend in the impatient. In the case, it would be like a, a patient or an impatient volunteer. Yeah, I'm actually making them both capitalists. Yeah, okay. yeah the best way to do it, I, I had one with capitalists and the other is not, but it, it made more sense to make them both capitalists and then look at how it all happens here. So. Oh, pardon me. It's cold. <coughs> It'll go down well on YouTube. <sighs> all the lectures are on YouTube, by the way. Have you taken a look yet? No, they're all there. And an interest payments and repayment. Now, at some point, I make a mistake in this, and you'll see. <coughs> oh, pardon me, the program correcting me. <sighs> So notice all the operations are on the liability side of the bank's ledger as well, which is very important. So you hire, the patient agent hires workers. The impatient agent does the same thing.
notice all the time the column the program is popping up whenever I make an entry showing there's a, a need to balance the row. Now I can zoom from the inpatient agent. I think I make a mistake here. No, oh no, not there. I've got bankers consuming, but they don't have any money in their system, so they can't actually consume, but I'm just putting them there as part of the structure. I know how I made the mistake. I didn't spot it first off either. Oh no, hang on. I know I make a mistake in one of these videos. It'll happen. Can you see the text clearly enough there? It's pretty small, isn't it? Unfortunately, sorry about that. Yeah, might be better watching it on YouTube. You can see the entries that are going in all the way through. I made a mistake. Sorry, I made a mistake. I forgot to put a minus sign in front of the impatience. So I get two time consumption turning up over here. Added an extra row. Adding patient consuming from impatient and vice versa. And I spotted my error, so I'm using a control back, a control left arrow here to move backwards one character at a time within that box and type the minus. And that row's okay. And then the final entry for impatient consuming from patient. So that's the whole table. Now, what I've got to show, of course, is lending. I've got lending by the patient agent to the inpatient agent. But how do I show that? Move that bank icon over a bit. Bring down a new one. Call this patient. And I'll now Notice it says no asset class at the moment with that first pop down. I think you can just see that in the box there. By clicking that, say that's an asset. Then the drop down says, What asset do you want to make it? And it's showing the liability from the other table. So if I say this is going to be the patient agent's bank account, as soon as I add another row, it whacks all the transactions that are currently in that bank account across and shows I've got to balance it here to show what that person is worth. So I've got to have net equity for the patient agent and now I've got to go through and put the minus and plus entries to balance what's currently there to show the overall worth of that agent. So make sure you get your accounting right across multiple tables which again is one of the reasons people have given up on Dragon Black Stella because they just you know, when they've got to do that multiple accounting, they just can't get it right. It's actually quite easy with Minsky. Yeah. Yeah, you can have assets, liabilities, and equity. 
So because the outpatient agent only has assets, then all you're putting the entries into, into an equity, net equity. We're going to bring up the inpatient agent. The inpatient agent has a liability, which is the loan, uh, by the patient agent. So plug all this in. Now they, they've now got the, uh, the asset of the loan. The, the, the loan by the patient agent to the inpatient is an asset of the patient agent. So I'm now working those here. And I made a mistake. I put the interest payments going into the ac asset. It should be going into the net worth. So what you can do, and I think I do it here, let's see. I'm typing in the minus 100 for the net worth as well. But having done that for the patient agent, I can now do exactly the same thing for the inpatient agent. Click on a bank, bring it down, call this inpatient. And then assets of agents, the one that's only left is the inpatient agents and the workers as well, I could put them in explicitly too. And now all the workers, all the operations turn up on the bank instantly. So all the balancing, you're told where the balancing is needed to go. And notice I've got the interest payments in the loan, I think that's what tweaked me to say I had it in the wrong position there. So it also helps you work out where you should actually put the flows. So I've got to fix that up, but I've got that, that's, that's getting most of the way to get the model written. And the mathematics, that's, that's a set of equations I've defined there. Okay. And the program generates them for you automatically. So you can actually get the latex code and put it into an article to see what has actually gone on. And notice that I've got lending as a positive here and a negative there. Repayment is a positive here and a negative there. Interest payments is negative here and a positive there. They all balance, they all cancel each other out. Now, if you look at what's happening, because they made them both capitalists, and the sum of money they've got is the sum of money in the firm sector. And the turnover of that money on an annual basis is GDP. And that turnover is not going to include any impact from net lending. Okay. That cancels out, that cancels out, and that cancels out. So the total amount of the money depends upon the turnover from consumption and wages, not from anything happening in the financial sector. And therefore, yes, you can ignore oh, there's other, other cancellations as well, of course. They're just patient agent, inpatient agent consuming from each other. So it all comes down to the flow from workers. That's it in this particular model for the amount of money actually in their accounts. Now, how does it differ to go to endogenous money? Well, the loan is now an asset of the bank. So I bring up the godly, the godly tables for each of those three agents now. And I come up to patient and I delete the loan. Not an asset of the patient agent, just delete it completely. Well, it's gone. Notice now I've now got the accounting balances pointed out, so currently imbalanced. So I delete those two rows as well. They don't belong there. But I come up to the bank and say, well, you've got now that asset, the loan asset is here. Click on make, a, make an asset of the banking sector. Click on the down, there it is, loans, bang, turns up at the right place. Okay. Now I fix up the interest payment, which I put in the wrong place beforehand. That's actually going across to the uh, bank's net worth. So you can just click and drag a flow element anywhere in the table. And now I come down here and delete interest as a, pay as a payment to the patient agent. And just to go and check and see that everything is correct. 
all the road sums are correct. That's all it's taken to go from a model of loanable funds to endogenous money. Okay. Now I can say, well, what are the, I think I'll get the equations next. Here are the equations for that model. And notice you don't have cancellation of lending anymore. Lending minus repayment minus interest change the amount of money in the firm sector. That's the essence of the difference in the vision of the two. And therefore it's adding to the amount of money that's turning over in the economy and therefore increasing GDP. That's the essential difference between the two visions. So lend minus repay is the measure of the growth of the amount of money in circulation. That's why the banking sector matters. It's simple. Yeah. It blows the conventional thinking out of the water because it come, the, the difference comes down to saying, are loans an asset of the banking sector or a liability? The answer is, duh, they're an asset. Therefore, endogenous money makes sense and loanable funds doesn't because you get a net expansion of the money supply coming out of that. And I can simulate the two models, of course, because what we've now done is whack in a whole set of definitions using a trick I showed you beforehand. And I'm just changing the simulation speed here. And notice the amount of money in loanable funds is constant and so is GDP. Now I can change the speed of lending up here and notice that as a result of that the debt ratio changes dramatically. Nothing happens to GDP. I can make repayment more uh, slow down. Debt ratio rises. Nothing happens to GDP or money. Okay. So the whole idea that you can ignore comes out of this loanable funds vision. And dramatic changes in the rate of change of debt change in the distribution of money between the two accounts. A debt ratio can exceed 100% GDP, no problem, but no impact on the economy itself. But if I now flip over to endogenous money, I'd do exactly the same thing for a start. The money supply is rising immediately, so is GDP. It's a model of a growing economy. If I change lending, money rises more rapidly and so does GDP. If I slow it down, or if I make repayment faster, the economy slows down. And you reduce GDP. So in that sense, completely wrong to say banks, lending and debt don't matter. They're vital in the nature of a capitalist economy. And let's see if I've got the, the simulation finished there. So banks, debt and money do matter. And to summarise with equations again, the flow of funds into the firm sector and loanable funds comes down to that sum. Okay. The flow of funds in endogenous money is that sum. So the difference is net lending plus the impact of the financial sector. So we have to revise macroeconomics to include that impact on effective demand. Let's take a break there. I might go and get an injection of vitamin C. You guys can get some coffee and we'll keep on going after that.